Now, all of those functions exist in every community in the country, including here. But in most places, we have invested most of them in health plans and disease management vendors. And patients end up getting called separately by their health plan care manager, you know, who may not talk to the physician practice at all, which isn't exactly what you would call coordinated care for the patient at that level. Now, medical home initiatives have gone a ways up this chart to help provide more resources for physicians to be able to spend more time, do better patient education, uh, be more proactive. But they really haven't gone the whole way in terms of really being able to provide the kinds of capacity uh, for truly accountable care. Because if you're going to give accountable care, you have to be thinking about, so how do I measure the return on investment? So if I spend more on a nurse, how do I know it's going to save money because am I keeping patients out of the hospital to be able to pay for that? When's the time frame for return? We've been doing lots of stuff on things that will have long-term return, but we've got to start figuring out some ways to save some money now, which is what employers um, and health plans are looking for. And we have to think about how do we target what we're doing to make sure that we're focusing on the people who need it most, not on the ones who are easiest, but potentially some of the ones where we can get the biggest impact. So if you're thinking about sort of how do you move to accountable care organizations, it's having all of these kinds of skills in physician practice. It doesn't mean the individual doctor has to do these things, but they have to be working in a practice that can provide those kinds of services to be able to effectively manage patients and be able to deliver higher value. So what's number two on my list of functions is you have to have more value-driven health delivery systems built on a foundation of strong physicians and particularly strong primary care practices. Um, but you can't manage what you can't measure, so it goes back to function number one. These two things are related. You're not going to have better value in your delivery systems if they don't have information. So for example, in Maine, there, and don't expect you to read all this, just, but Maine is trying to provide dashboards to their particularly primary care practices to give them information about how their patients are doing. Not just on things like HbA1c scores, but on how often their patients are getting surgery, knee surgery, heart surgery, how often they're going uh, for other kinds of treatments, how often they're going to the ER, so that they can tell, do my patients have this problem or not? And how am I doing if I try to fix that? Um, and I have to say, I mean, we've been spending a lot of money recently in the country on getting more data. So we've been building the EHRs, but the question is, are we spending enough money? My answer is no. We're not spending enough money and time trying to actually figure out how to turn that into useful information for people. And we've got to be spending as much time um, uh, using the term of the day, making sure that it's used meaningfully, not just the fact that it exists. Now that runs you, if I got information and I got a system that wants to be more value driven, you run smack into the problem of the payment system. Because the way we pay for healthcare today, doctors and hospitals make more money if the patients get infections and complications and get readmitted. Doctors and hospitals make more money the more often patients go to the hospital. And nobody in healthcare makes any money at all when the patients stay well. What kind of an incentive is that? So the question is, um, is there a way, oh, sorry, um, that's number three, is getting more value-driven payment systems. So the question is, what are those? Are there better ways to pay for health care that will help to fix those problems and support this better quality care? Two basic concepts. One is the notion of an episode payment, which is to say, when somebody goes to the hospital, rather than having separate payments to the doctor and to the hospital and separate more payments if you get an infection and more payments if you get a readmission, there's a single payment for all the care associated with that, including complications, infections, no more, no more extra money for that. It's the same concept that every other industry in America has, which is the notion of a warranty, that I deliver my product or service with a warranty, and if something goes wrong with it, I fix it free of charge. Now, this sounded like an insane concept in healthcare until a few years ago when the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania started to do this. They didn't call it a warranty, the New York Times called it a warranty, but they basically said, we're going to have what we call proven care, and we're going to have a single payment for everything, pre-admission, both physician and hospital, post-acute care, and any related complications or readmissions. And they started this with cardiac bypass surgery, and they've been systematically expanding it to other areas, including things like maternity care and back pain. And 
what it turned out was it was a win-win-win. It was a win for the patients, not little itsy bitsy statistically significant improvements, but big statistically significant improvements, 20, 40 percent reductions in complications and readmissions. It was better for the health system. They actually made more money by doing this. And the health plan spent less. Geisinger tells a story about how the school teachers in their community were able to get bigger raises because they didn't have to spend so much money on health insurance anymore. Now, this is my version of the triple aim. I have a different triple aim than Don Berwick. My triple aim is better care for patients, lower spending on health care, and more viable health care providers. Because we can't have a system that puts doctors and hospitals out of business. Now, the myth that has developed is that you have to be a Geisinger to do this. You have to be a big integrated system with physicians on salary and your own health plan, all that kind of stuff. But the earliest documented example of anybody offering a warranty was a single doc in Lansing, Michigan, orthopedic surgeon, shoulder and knee guy, said, I'm going to give a two-year warranty. Anything goes wrong with what I do, I will fix it free of charge. And it's in the literature, doctor made more money, hospital made more money, health plan spent less, and the patients were better off. Why? Because when you paid in a different way, there was all of a sudden the opportunity to start eliminating all the unnecessary stuff and figure out how to actually make things better to be able to get better outcomes for the patients. So this can be done by not only big systems, but individual docs and hospitals. And so the problem with episodes, so some people might say, well, let's just do episode payments for, for all this stuff. The problem is, how do you prevent unnecessary episodes of care? So for those diabetic patients, I don't simply want them to, whenever they go in for their amputation, get, not get an infection. I want to reduce the frequency with which they're going in for an amputation. I want to keep those chronic disease patients out of the hospital in the first place. And I want to reduce some of the unnecessary surgery that's going on. So the second uh, big idea is what I prefer to call comprehensive care payment. A lot of people call global payment, single payment for management of a particular condition, regardless of how often the patient has to be hospitalized. I prefer the term comprehensive care payment because I think when we say global payment, I'm afraid the patients are going to think we're sending them to India or Thailand to be able to get, you're going to get your amputation over there. Um, but the basic idea is single payment for comprehensive care of a condition like diabetes or COPD or CHF. Um, and we know, we have proven this over and over and over again in multiple studies. We can reduce hospitalizations dramatically. Again, not little sort of, you know, a couple percentage changes. 20, 40, 60 percent reductions in hospitalizations and ER visits by doing very simple things. Having nurses provide patient education, doing telemonitoring to try to identify early when a patient's having a problem. So why don't we do that? Well, the answer is we don't pay for that. This is my picture of how we pay for healthcare today. We pay for office visits and physicians. We don't pay for phone calls. If you wonder why your doctor, you can't get your doctor on the phone, we don't pay them to answer the phone. They're busy trying to fill up the practice with as many office visits as possible because that's what pays their staff. We don't pay them to hire a nurse care manager to work with the patients. But we pay them every time the patient shows up in the ER, we pay every time they show up in the hospital, we pay every time that they get an extra test. So the idea of a comprehensive care payment or a global payment is to say there will be a single payment for managing the patient's condition and you decide what is the best way to deliver that care. If it's going to make more sense to do phone calls, hire a nurse because you'll save money over here, you have the flexibility to be able uh, to do that. Um, um, this is what uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield in, of Massachusetts is doing uh, through something they call the alternative quality contract. They're paying uh, healthcare providers a single payment for a population of patients. It's a risk adjusted payment, so you get paid more if you have patients who are sicker or have multiple conditions. Um, you, they get a quality bonus if they do better on quality measures for some of the long term things. And importantly, it's a five year contract. It's not just the payment method, but it's the fact that it is a five-year contract which actually enables the healthcare provider to reap some of the savings from doing things like prevention and investing in electronic health records. And they've had very broad participation in this. Again, not just big systems, so they have a primary care independent practice association with 72 docs in it, and they just released their results, or preliminary results on this um, uh, earlier in the year, very positive in terms of higher quality, keeping pa patients out of the ER and reducing readmissions. 
Now, the problem is that's a big jump for particularly small primary care practices to make. So people, important, I think, to have transitional payment systems. Sort of how do you get started on this? Now, the transitional system that's being advocated nationally is called shared savings. The notion of shared savings is we won't actually change the way you're paid today. But if you can figure out some way to keep the patients out of the hospital and out of the ER and reduce the number of tests and save some money, we'll give some of it back to you in a couple years. So if you're a primary care practice, this is an obvious path to success, right? You go to your very large bank account and you draw on the reserves from there to make all these investments, you know, and then hope that in fact, you know, Medicare or health plan will pay you the money down the road. And I'm not a big fan of the shared savings model, uh, partly because it doesn't give you any upfront money to be able to make the investments that you need in better quality care. Um, it doesn't, it's not really transitional in the sense that you're still, you have to reduce total costs. So you could do a really swell job of keeping your diabetic patients out of the hospital, but if a bunch of them end up with cancer and the oncologists spend more on treating them, you don't get any money back because total costs didn't go down. Um, I think that the folks in Miami are probably going to be a whole lot happier with this model than the folks in other parts of the country because the places that are sending people to the hospital much more frequently, uh, McAllen, Texas, et cetera, will do better. Um, but the fundamental problem is it doesn't actually change the way we pay for health care. It's just another pay for performance bolt on to the top of the current system. So it is not really true payment reform. So what would be a better transition system? Well, to me, you need to pay up front. You need to enable people to, to change the way they deliver care, or get paid for the phone goals, have, be able to afford to hire a nurse care manager. But primary care practices should take some accountability for making sure that what they're doing actually does reduce costs, does keep people out of the hospital, out of the ER, et cetera. So they should take accountability for some specific targets. And then you could have a pay for performance bonus penalty kind of system on that because you're changing the basic way it's being paid for, but you're giving some accountability so that that would then feed back to that uh, practice. This is what, uh, let me give you an example of how this would work. So I'll take a, uh, this is my uh, hypothetical underpaid uh, PCP practice. Four docs, they have a 2,000 uh, patient panel each. Uh, the health plan's paying them about a million one a year. They're spending uh, $400,000 a year to sort of, you know, fight with everybody about whether I'm getting reimbursed the right way, et cetera. And that leaves over uh, $180,000 to pay the docs their salary. At the same time, this physician practice's patients are showing up at the ER at the rate of 200 per thousand. Typical commercial rate at which patients show up at the ER. 40% of those visits are preventable. Lots of studies have shown everything from the sniffles to the chronic disease uh, exacerbations. So that payer spent $1,000 for each of those. They're spending $640,000 a year on these preventable ER visits. Suppose the primary care practice would say, let's hire a nurse practitioner have them do more patient education, be able to answer patients' phone calls, maybe do some uh, later, later office hours, spend $90,000 on that, and if that could reduce preventable ER visits by 40%, 40% of the 40%, and many medical home projects around the country have done that, that would save the health plan a quarter million dollars. But who wins and who loses in this, right? Where does the primary care practice get the $90,000? to save the health plan a quarter million dollars. So the logical thing is for the health plan to say, well, I'll pay you for the nurse care manager, the nurse practitioner, because even if I do, I'm still saving money compared to what I was saving before. The question is, what's the incentive for that practice if they hire that nurse to make sure that they keep our people out of the hospital, out of the ER? Well, the answer is you could have some kind of a reward. For example, you could say, we'll share the net savings with you. So if the health plan said, I'll give you back 50% of the net savings that you achieve, health plan still is actually spending 13% less on ER visits, preventable ER vis visits than they were before. That $83,000 could mean a 12% salary increase to the primary care physicians in that practice. Win, win, win. Patients are better off, physicians are better off, health plan's better off. And hopefully the employers who are using that health plan. But you have to have a mechanism of giving the upfront payment to the practice, and you have to have targets that are achievable by that primary care practice, not managing total costs, but things like keeping patients out of the ER, out of the hospital. 